Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about some surprising SIBO root causes that I've seen in my students with FODMAP Freedom and in my clinical practice with patients. As always, remember the backstory with this, if you rewind a couple episodes ago, we're talking about root causes of SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Two foundational things to recognize though are that these SIBO root causes oftentimes work in very similar ways. So number one, remember that the name of the game is to move food and the contents of your gut from your mouth, through the esophagus, stomach, small bowel, colon, and out. And that's how it should go. But if you get stagnation or dysmotility, poor motility, that's when stuff starts to get weird. So a lot of these SIBO root causes are inherently root causes of dysmotility or poor motility. So keep that in the back of your head. The other thing to emphasize here is that for all that we call this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and that kind of leads us in the direction of thinking it's an infection, SIBO in fact is not an infection. It's a state of dysbiosis. So recall that dysbiosis just means that the normal balance between good and bad, good and evil in the world of the gut is askew. And like any seesaw, usually both ends will move simultaneously. So it's not just that one end of the seesaw stays put and the other end goes up. In this case, the bad microbes going up. It's usually a little bit of both where you get an overgrowth of bad guys and a depletion of good guys that would normally keep them in check. And that's where you start to get symptomatic. There have been research studies now that are starting to indicate that not only that dysbiosis is common, and a hallmark of SIBO in the small bowel, but also that the degree of dysbiosis correlates with symptoms rather than the degree of the overgrowth itself. So assuming that you're here watching this YouTube video, probably in the middle of the night, I don't know, YouTube is weird. If you're watching this video, I assume it's because you want to get rid of symptoms and it's not just for shits and giggles, pun totally intended, learning about SIBO just for the fun of it. If you want to get rid of symptoms and you want to feel normal again, you really need to focus more on this dysbiosis model rather than just hammering the snot out of your bad microbes. So without further ado, let's get into the first couple of SIBO root causes that might surprise you. All right, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about first and foremost, and that is sleep. Poor sleep or not enough sleep or dysregulated sleep can in fact cause SIBO by way of a similar mechanism as we talked about in a previous video with stress. It's basically your ability to get into rest and digest is gonna enhance your vagal tone and your vagus nerve function and your motility. So if you're in rest and digest, you're motoring through, you're keeping things moving at an appropriate pace, and there's no stagnation, no buildup, no chance for SIBO. But if you're stuck in fight, flight, freeze, appease, or the sympathetic side of the nervous system, then you're not only not gonna digest, you're also not gonna get appropriate rest. So this is a little bit of a catch-22 where sometimes people treat their gut and then the sleep gets better. But more often than not, you focus on the sleep and then the gut gets better after the fact. So keep in mind, it's a bi-directional street, but it does seem to go more like sleep improving gut health versus the other way around. Now, and I will say too, that we have, we have an episode about sleep on the IBS Freedom Podcast. Um, one thing to know is that there are different flavors of poor sleep and there are different herbs and different strategies and interventions that can help with that. So somebody who has a lot of mind chatter and has a hard time falling asleep is gonna be treated very, very differently from somebody who falls asleep fine, but then they wake up in the middle of the night or somebody whose blood sugar is sending them on a roller coaster and that wakes them up in the middle of the night or early, early in the morning. Or somebody who is so stressed and so anxious that they have really, really light, shitty sleep, pun again, totally intended, and they're never getting into deep sleep or REM sleep. The other one I wanna draw your attention to is that sleep disordered breathing or mouth breathing when you sleep is a big deal from two perspectives. A, that can actually dysregulate your blood sugar regulation. So if you have some higher blood sugar in the morning or some, some struggle with hyperglycemia, keep that in mind. And again, that was in the previous video, the top nine SIBO root causes, one of which was hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. So do bear that in mind. But also, if you're breathing through your mouth at night and you have sleep disordered breathing, one of which is apnea, then you're getting more oxygen to the microbiome in your mouth and you're causing dysbiosis in the mouth 
And then guess what? You're swallowing a lot of that bacteria and it's going down the esophagus into the stomach and you guessed it into the small bowel. So not only do you get the blood sugar and the inflammatory consequences of mouth breathing or disordered breathing at night, you also get the microbial piece too. So it's the double whammy from a SIBO perspective. But this is way too big of a beast to chew on in one small little YouTube video. I encourage you to go ahead and check out some of the resources on the IBS Freedom Podcast and some of the videos on this channel to get more of a deep dive. And if you want me to do videos on this channel specifically about those different types of poor sleep and how they contribute to poor gut health, let me know in the comments because I'd love to do those videos. I just have some other ones that I'm scheduling out of time. So I don't know. It, if enough people comment, maybe I'll bump that up in the list and prioritize getting those sleep videos made here on this channel instead. So just let me know. The next one will probably surprise you and hit a little bit close to home if I'm being honest. And they go hand in hand. So a lack of dietary diversity but when I say that, I really mean the diversity of your fiber sources is one, and the other is not enough calories or not enough of a specific micro or macronutrient to meet your nutritional needs. Now, both of these are nutritional related and they both boil down to diversifying the diet and making sure that you're nutritionally replete, but they have slightly different consequences and different ways that they can cause SIBO. So for the lack of fiber diversity, this is going to come up, especially with a lot of SIBO treatments, people who are doing low FODMAP or SCD or biphasic, or they're just strategically eliminating food after food after food in the name of healing their gut. And not only does that lead to more inflammation because the immune system loses tolerance for those foods and it loses tolerance for the world around it. So you start to get this net rise in inflammation when you narrow your diet. The more important thing for our perspective here with SIBO specifically is the seesaw. It's that dysbiosis. So remember that fiber feeds the good bacteria. And we now know, or maybe you knew for a while, that SIBO is not just an overgrowth of the bad guys. It's an overgrowth of the bad guys and a corresponding lack of good guys. And if you don't have a nice diversity of fiber and plant foods in your diet, you're not going to feed the microbiome what it needs to get those good guys back up. So do keep this in mind. I actually have a link, I'll put it down below on that, the um, fodmapfreedom.com backslash social, the link. There's two things that you might wanna download from there. One of which is my microbiome diversity tracker tool, where you go through and it's basically like a modified food diary with some goals and I link to a research article talking about why this is important. So go ahead and check that. It's down like towards the bottom of that page where there's a bunch of downloadable goodies in there. The other thing is that I made a SIBO root cause guide for you guys and we talk about these as well as some of the ones from the other video and I put a lot of different resources and links and videos in there so that you can take a deep dive in these topics if one of them resonates with you. So likewise, I'll put that down in the link down below or in the top comment. But going back to this, so if a lack of fiber or a lack of diversity in your fiber intake is gonna create more dysbiosis, then that theoretically should cause more symptoms, right? Because I said, this is the thing that tracks with symptom presentation, not the degree of the overgrowth. The calorie and macros comes into play, especially with people with a history of disordered eating. I see a lot of people who don't think that they have disordered eating when in fact they do just because you haven't been diagnosed with anorexia or bulimia, some of like the poster child, uh, more famous versions of disordered eating, it doesn't mean that you, this is not a problem for you. If you have orthorexic behavior, so like being obsessive about, about nutrition and doing things the healthiest way possible, that is in, is going to be a variant of disordered eating. Um, but just being too strict with your diet or not getting enough calories or not enough protein or carbs or fat can be deleterious to your ability to heal. Because remember, healing is an energy intensive job, right? Like you have to put in effort and you have to put in fuel and resources and you have to build new enzymes, which are made out of protein and you need healthy cells and healthy metabolism to heal all of your stuff and like shuttle out all of the old dead stuff that you don't need anymore and bring in new materials, that requires a lot of energy. And if you're not giving your body an adequate amount of energy, it's gonna be really, really hard for you to heal stuff. I especially see people under, under shooting on calories and protein and carbs is probably a runner up. I'm not seeing as many people undershoot on fat in this day and age just because keto and carnivore and paleo 
Uh, these diets have tended to be much higher in fat. Like, obviously, keto would be defined as high fat. Uh, but high fat diets are kind of all the rage right now. So I don't see people undershooting on fat nearly as much, but I see a lot of people who are undershooting on either protein or carbs or both, or just calorie need in general. So make sure that you're giving yourself the fuel to actually heal your body when you're demanding so much from your body. Next up, I want to talk a little bit about what's called toxicant exposure. So a toxin is something that's poisonous and would kill you dead right away. A toxicant is something with toxin-like characteristics, but it's not gonna kill you immediately. So there's a lot of these in our world. We are riddled with them. We're never going to escape all of them. Prime examples include heavy metals, things like bisphenol, like BPA, phthalates, parabens, PCBs. They're all over the place in our cosmetics, in our air, in our soil, our water. They're just, they're, they're everywhere. Pesticides, herbicides, but I wanna just make a point of saying that toxic exposure can work a couple of different ways. And I've only seen this really cause SIBO, in my opinion, a few times, but it's not something to be neglected, especially just being that we live in this crazy toxic world. A, remember that toxins or toxicants in this, in this context are inherently inflammatory. And remember that one of the things we talked about in the previous video was that unchecked inflammation and autoimmunity can drive dysmotility because it's going to fry your vagus nerve. So I think in that sense, if toxicants cause inflammation and immune dysfunction, then that has the potential to be burdensome to the nervous system. Some of them are burdensome to the nervous system in and of themselves, things like aluminum and mercury and some others that can get past the bullet brain barrier, for example. The other thing is remember, if you remember your anatomy, granted, this is not anatomically accurate, but imagine if the stomach is right here, the liver is right here next door and the liver and the gut share structure and function. They have a network of, of blood vessels and veins that connect each other because the liver is processing all of the food, all of the nutrients, all of the blood that's coming up from the gut. So the very first place that blood is going after it gets into the gut is to your liver. So if there's overburden some stuff, if the liver is overburdened rather, then that could put a lot of undue stress on the gut liver axis, which is a very real thing. Again, is this the most common cause of SIBO? No, not in my opinion, but I can share, I have a friend actually who is in the nutrition field herself and she was diagnosed with SIBO a number of years ago. She worked with famous internet uh, people who will remain nameless. She was on a million gazillion supplements. She was doing very restrictive diets and she was making precisely zero progress. She was feeling worse. And it just so happened that in her, the program that she was studying in, she got to meet a naturopath and she started picking his brain for a couple, just like a couple minutes at a conference. And he said, it sounds like you have mercury toxicity because she was eating fish like three, four times a week at the insistence of this functional medicine provider. And he said, I think you have mercury overload issues. Um, stop everything you're doing, stop all the supplements, just reduce, reduce your mercury intake and supplement with glutathione. Follow up with me in a couple of months. And that was the big shift. Now for her, was it because she was starting to reintroduce foods and she was getting more fiber diversity and more calories and more macros? Is it because she wasn't stressed out that she was going broke from taking a million gajillion supplements anymore and maybe she was getting better sleep at night because she wasn't worried that she wouldn't be able to afford $400 of supplements every month? Or was it because she started detoxing the mercury and getting that out of her system and she wasn't burdening herself with toxicants? We won't know, we have no, no way of knowing now, but it was pretty interesting that when she started to do some stuff specific for detoxification and getting the mercury out, that that ended up being the thing that moved the needle quite a bit for her. So I do think toxicants can drive SIBO. I don't think they're the most common, but they are a potential culprit. And you can start kind of taking a deep dive down the rabbit hole and researching that a little bit more. It's deeply terrifying, but it's worth the effort. Just know that we're never going to have zero exposure to these things. We're always gonna have some in the background because we live on planet Earth and we are slowly but surely killing this planet. So it is what it is. Just try to reduce your exposure as much as you can. Now, now that I scared the bejesus out of you, I'll go into two that I think are related, even though they're a little bit separate. Sears, 
for chronic inflammatory response syndrome is from things like mold exposure and Lyme disease or tick-borne disease. I'm also gonna lump infections in general as the last one on this list, as my number seven. And the big driver here seems to be, in my opinion, that both of these things will uh, cause immune disruption and inflammation, and then that inflammation affects the motility and the vagus nerve and the gut-brain axis. So that's how I think they work out. Not coincidentally, there's, there's some distinct overlap with the last three on this list. You need to focus a lot on detoxification if you're exposed to toxicants. Similarly, one of the really kind of key points with Sears is that you need to focus on detoxing. A lot of these biotoxin illnesses like Lyme and mold are characterized not just by the presence of an infection like with Lyme disease, but also these biotoxins, these sticky, nasty things that get into your cells and jam up the works. You need to actually facilitate removal and detoxification of those and excrete them so that your cells can function better. So there, the middle one here, Sears, is a little bit of a hybrid between the two because you need to work on the immune system and the infectious agent if there is one, but you also need to work on detoxification if you have Sears. That is a whole, whole giant, giant conversation that is way too complicated for this short video, but I will provide some resources in that PDF that I've linked down below so that you can get more into that as time goes on. And then last but not least, I'm going to make mention of chronic infections. Now, if you have a cold or the flu and you get over it in a week or two, I don't think that's enough to cause SIBO, but I'm talking about things like chronic Lyme disease or a chronic staph skin infection or a chronic like back, bacterial vaginosis or a chronic like sinus kind of thing. Um, even possibly chronic Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegalovirus like a chronic viral illness could potentially be a driver here. I think with all of those, you need to look at the root cause of the root cause in the sense of asking why is my immune system not strong enough or healthy enough to tackle this infectious agent on its own. So you still need to look a little bit deeper with this one, but infections have a way of keeping the immune system occupied and pretty pissed off. And if those two things are just so, you get enough inflammation and possibly autoimmunity to really perturb the motility and then bada bing bada boom, now your infection has caused a state of dysbiosis and it's caused SIBO for you. And then that of course makes more inflammation and then your immune system is really worked up. So it's, it's very much something that can spiral out of control. But again, that's a little bit more than we can cover in this video. But nonetheless, like I said, these are the three that kind of go together. Mostly here you're gonna focus on detoxification efforts and reducing your exposure. Here you're gonna focus on detoxification, reducing exposure and facilitating proper immune activation. And here you're really focusing mostly on getting the immune system to work better so that you can clear your infection and recover from it. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. As I said, I've got some downloadable goodies down below. I'm gonna provide both of those links. So there's the, uh, the gut diversity tracker, which will help you assess whether or not you're getting a good diversity of fiber to treat your dysbiosis. And there's the brand new, snazzy, beautiful SIBO root cause guide. And that goes into much more detail on these root causes, as well as the ones from the previous video, as well as some foundational stuff about like how to use the information once you identify the root cause, like what do you do now? Loads of goodies in there and lots of links to other videos so that you don't have to go scouring the internet for the rest of my videos that I mentioned. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Drop a comment down below if you have a wish list of a topic that you would like me to cover or if you want me to get, get moving and do those sleep videos like I mentioned. And of course, I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.